And I understand there's a little traffic uh, outside. I'm, that should be no shock to anybody that's been around here for a while. Um, and, a, and a couple of our uh, county administrative staff, particularly uh, Attorney Mumford, is, is tied up in the traffic, and possibly even Mr. Hours. But we'll get we'll get going here. It'll be the usual uh, town hall meeting where we'll uh, spend an hour and a half together. Uh, I'm going to give a PowerPoint presentation, hopefully for 20 minutes. So I'm not going to really dig into some of these issues as deeply as I might in order to uh, get more uh, into the hour and a half we have. And then we'll have questions, again, limited to a minute and a half on the question and or the statement. If somebody just doesn't have a question but just wants to make a statement, that's fine also. But then at 7.10, we're going we're to uh, shut things down and we're going to uh, put up the uh, documentary film made by Lance Lip Lipman and George Crane called uh, St. Simon's Island Surviving Success. I've had an opportunity to uh, have a viewing, uh, and I think you all will enjoy that. Uh, so without further ado, here we go. Uh, it tried to do these things quarterly, and uh, this is the second one of this year. So let me start off talking about the SPLOST issues, uh, uh, the, one, the ones we've completed, the ones we're uh, involved in uh, uh, doing. And as uh, you all know, uh, the Demery and Frederica roads have been resurfaced. Uh, Ocean and Harrington sidewalks uh, have been uh, completed. The East Beach Causeway uh, in the middle has been resurfaced. Uh, and I think uh, we, we learned a lot with Demery. Uh, it, it, it was a good product in the final analysis, but I think that the only way we could have possibly gotten through the, uh, most of the agony with, with Frederica was to do most of it at night. I know some of it wasn't done at night, but most of it was. And I think the product is really something we can be proud of. In progress is the village uh, drainage uh, project, which has become uh, quite problematic. Uh, it started a little later than we had hoped. Uh, there were multiple bumps along the way. Some of the bumps uh, were due to supplier issues. Some of the uh, concrete uh, uh, boxes we needed to uh, put the piping and the drainage together uh, as, as they dug up the, the, the road. The sizes uh, weren't what were to be expected. Uh, cement suppliers uh, didn't have cement on a regular basis. Uh, we dug up uh, the road with diagrams and plans from years past, and, and what they found in those areas had nothing to do with the plan. So they came across water lines that should have been where they were. They came across big pipes. One big pipe uh, was just completely in the middle of the road, disconnected, and nobody knew where it uh, came from or went. So uh, we we're about a month and a half behind, and I'll show a picture of that. The good news is we, we, we had pre-planning meetings uh, with the merchants in, in the village. We've had weekly meetings with the merchants in the village. And today uh, we had our Wednesday, regular Wednesday meeting, and we were told eight working days they will be buttoned up and done uh, in the village. And that means sidewalks in, uh, pipes in, uh, flowable fill over top of the pipes and, and asphalting done. Uh, now, eight, that's eight working days. If, if we get rain, heavy rain, they can't work, that would add another day. Remaining uh, would be the roundabouts at either end of the East Beach Causeway, Demery and, and uh, Ocean, and the intersection improvement at Frederica and Kingsway. You may have heard that there's some uh, right-of-way acquisition issues uh, in these two areas. I don't think these are going to be major impediments. The reason they haven't been done up to the present time is we just simply couldn't do them at the, up, at the present time. You can't imagine uh, redoing the intersection of Kingsway and Frederica with a village drainage project going on and, and the entire uh, resurfacing of Frederica Road going on. So we had always planned to do those later in the year. So we're going to have a meeting tomorrow uh, amongst staff to try to decide the, the order of operation to get those done. Um, and obviously, there's, there's never a good time to do any of these projects. But we put some of these things off so long, we just simply are not going to put them off any longer. Um, we just have to get these things done. And as I said, there's no good time, uh, but we will get them done uh, with, with understanding of what the conflicts might be. So, you know, this is what this is what Frederica Road looks now. This part of this used to be the old dead grapevine, and uh, this uh, uh, partly uh, Sea Islands work, and 
A lot of it is our public works uh, department along with uh, uh, prisoner detail work, uh, the newly uh, resurfaced uh, and uh, milled Frederica Road. I think it just looks absolutely spectacular. I'm particularly proud of that palm tree as I drive by. That was a little dwarf palm tree that was in probably within weeks of death and, and, and now it's a beautiful palm tree. So I think this just shows how wonderful things can be. Not so much over here. So we've got, if you went down to the village today as we did for our weekly meeting, you, you simply can't believe what this hole looks like. And this hole is on the east side of Mallory, but that hole two weeks ago was on the west side of Mallory. And now we've got a beautiful sidewalk on, on the west side of Mallory. We've got nice curb. We've got multiple new inlets in there. And, and this isn't re-asphalted yet, but it will be uh, within the next eight working days. So, so we're getting there. It's been painful, but at the end of the day, uh, th this simply couldn't be put off any longer. There was a lady that owns a bookshop on the west side of the road who every time a heavy rain came would put sandbags out in front of her, her shop. I mean, is, is that the way we live, 21st century in Glynn County? I don't think so. Uh, and then, of course, the best laid plans. Any of those of you that live in sea palms uh, have been experiencing this. But just the other day, we finished laying down this beautiful strip of asphalt. And, and what happened is one of those darn water pipes underneath the ground uh, broke, created a big sinkhole, and it shut off water going to Brogan's North and uh, La Plancha. Uh, but there's now a, a, a repair spot within a week of completion of our beautiful Frederica Road. And I think, you know, what really is most important to take home about this is that's reflective of what's underneath the ground. Joint Water and Sewer has incalculable incomprehensible magnitude of problems. And, and I promise you they're between 250 and 500 million dollars in, in, in aggregate. So any, you know, any smiley faces they might, make, might put on, I, I think you all need to challenge them. We had an independent engineer that came to St. Simons and looked at our water. Our water was given, uh, I believe our water was a D on an ABCD scale uh, and our wastewater treatment plant was a D plus. And these things are becoming more frequent, and that's a, particularly worrisome to me. So going forward, we're going to have what's known as SPLOS 2020. And, and right now, when you think about it, uh, our revenue stream is property taxes, ad valorem taxes, licenses, fees. And really, those dollars go to run the county government. You know, if that's all we had, you probably wouldn't need any commissioners. You just need a staff. And, and people have challenged me, oh, there's a lot of waste in the county government. I don't think so. I'm willing to challenge anybody on that. I've gone through the six-inch binder. I've said this many times. I get mocked on the radio when I say it. And, and somebody calls and says, well, there's, there's not too many paper clips. There's not too, many, uh, too much printer paper. So I looked on Amazon. You can get 5,000 high-quality paper clips for $150. And you can get 15,000 high quality printer paper uh, pages for I think $250. So even if we saved on paper clips and paper, that still wouldn't really move the, move the needle towards solving any of our county problems. So the point is, the way we get revenue to solve the problems right now, the only revenue stream we have is SPLOST. And SPLOST will come again for a vote in 2020. So pay attention. We, we as uh, commissioners cannot lobby for the SPLOST. We can have educational sessions. But trust me, they're as important as anything that might happen. But on the other hand, also, we're compiling a list of possible projects for the SPLOST program. And that's where uh, Dave Austin, Alan Hours, all the commissioners have gotten together and we discussed various needs. If, if you all see a significant need, and I'm not talking about, I don't know, you know, a pothole in, in a street in your neighborhood. I'm talking about a significant, you know, costly project that we don't seem to be having our eyes and focus on. Let, let one of the commissioners know. Let one of the uh, uh, administrative staff know because uh, this is something we're all going to vote on. Uh, I believe the revenues will be needed and the duration of the SPLOS project can either be I think it's three, four, five, or six years. So there's a lot of, a lot of things that have to be decided over the next uh, year or so on this blast. 
Next topic, short-term rental regulation. Just to bring you up, uh, we, we are still in a discussion with host compliance, the consultant that has experience with working with communities. Uh, we're, we're doing the vetting process and host compliance to make sure that other communities have used them are satisfied. Uh, just this past legislative term, there was a, a threat that the uh, legislators uh, pushed by lobbyists for Airbnb and VRBO we're going to try to get a, a House Bill 523 passed, which would take uh, all of the regulation and control away from local governments and put it in the hands uh, of the, the central government in, in Atlanta. And I thought our chairman, Mike Brownie, uh, put it best when he heard this. He said, okay, when people have a problem down here and there's an issue with a short-term rental problem, who are they going to call in Atlanta? Who, who's, the, who's the person on the other end? And obviously, the answer is nobody. So fortunately, we've been able to uh, keep this as a local issue, but, but I, I, I'm virtually certain that the, uh, I have talked to the main uh, lobbyist who works for v VRBO, and, and she was very nice to talk to, and, and she, there's an apocryphal case, possibly true, I don't know if it is or not, Aaron suggests it probably is, that there's a small county in northern Georgia where they outlawed uh, these short-term rentals. Can't have it in our county, small county. A lady still rented her house, got thrown in jail. So now she's the poster child of why Airbnb and VRBO thinks there should be no local reg regulation. So we have to keep our eye on that. We have about 1,100 of these units in our county uh, and uh, there will be uh, permitting fees and uh, revenues to be dealt with. And these are the ways we hope uh, host compliance can help us to uh, get a, a, a registry going, know who's renting these houses off, uh, monitor the compliance, monitor the taxes, but also have a tax, uh, dedicated hotline. Because as you know, uh, our code enforcement people don't work nights and weekends. And a lot of the parties and issues with trash and other things, when they occur in your neighborhoods and it's a rental and the person's gone that was renting the place and you don't have any idea where the true owner lives, who do you call? Well. That would, uh, that would be uh, host compliance if we, uh, if we uh, sign an agreement with them. Shoreline protection. Uh, Assistant County Manager uh, Catherine Downs is with us tonight. She's quarterbacking this. So this, this shouldn't be a surprise to any one of you. This is just past high tide outside Neptune Park. It is not a rough day. Look how high the water came to the tops of our Johnson Rocks. The Johnson Rocks are our front line of protection along the uh, uh, Atlantic shoreline of St. Simons Island. They have sunken. They were put in in the uh, mid-60s. Uh, we've been able to uh, get a grant from the governor for $2.5 million. We have a group that's come down to look at it. Uh, I believe it's an ATM consulting group. We've had some open house and uh, uh, meetings and, and, and sessions with, with people up at the casino on St. Simons down, down by the pier. And uh, my understanding is the money we have available will allow us to restore the height of those Johnson Rocks to eight and a half to nine feet. And in, in, in many areas, they're, they're about six feet. Here's the rub, though. Those rocks... Some are on public property and some are on private property. We cannot restore the rocks on private property. What I don't know, and maybe Catherine can help us with this, is what's the definition of private property or public property? Because as you know, the Shore Protection Act, there's a 25-foot uh, uh, line, a 25-foot 20 20 foot, 25 foot wide area of jurisdiction that redounds uh, to uh, the DNR. So. Uh, that, that is still your property, but they have jurisdiction over what can and cannot happen there. So uh, I don't know how we define what is private and what is public. It's going to become a very important issue because obviously we want the entire uh, revetment restored because if you're in an area where you're, say, uh, a block off the water, and the people immediately on the water decide not to restore their Johnson Rocks and, and the storm surge comes over, it will probably uh, breach that area first and reach you uh, with a sudden storm surge of some velocity rather quickly. So uh, hopefully we can put the uh, different pieces together because of this $2.5 million, I think my numbers are right, Catherine, 
we can do the public part of the project for approximately $1.8 million, but the whole revetment might be $3.1 million. So there will need to be some input from private individuals, but there's never better time to do it than now because all the equipment will be here, the, uh, the, the, the workers will be here, the rocks will be purchased uh, in, in mass, so you're never going to get it done for a, a less expensive uh, a potential than, than, than right now. And I believe the time frame to do this will be uh, November through April. Am I doing okay so far, Catherine? All right, thanks. All right, here's another great one. Where's, where's my friend, the Colonel? Is he in the fray? Oh, there he is, okay. Golf carts. So we really, we really are uh, sort of uh, under, under the uh, guidelines of the state. And what we have now are ordinances that are bubbling up through the commissioners. And as soon as the other, they've been written, as soon as the other commissioners have a chance to look at them, we have a chance to uh, either change, uh, modify, vote them up and down. But basically, it, it breaks down to two types of vehicles. One called a PTV, a personal transportation vehicle. The other one, LSV. The difference is the speed. The PTVs only go 18, 19 miles an hour. They're basically your golf carts. They are only allowed on roads up to 25 miles an hour. The ones that go 25 miles an hour, called the low speed vehicles, the LSVs, can go on roads up to 35 miles an hour. They cannot be on roads like Frederica Road along the airport, where I was riding with my wife the other evening, and a, a golf cart was coming towards me as we were going north, and some young, young lady decided to pass, and her, her predictability of the distances and the speed was not good, and we had to come to a complete stop on Frederica Road going north so she could cut back in in front of the golf cart. Two things. One, that cart never should have been there. And two, she shouldn't have been in a situation where she had to pass a, a cart on a road that's 45 miles an hour. So, and I'm giving you the short story here, but there will be registration and insurance requirements. The Glen County Police are in agreement to, to enforce once this become law. The uh, PTV violations will go to the magistrate court. The LSV violations will still go to the state court. Unfortunately, Seat belts and tri uh, child restraints, they're supposed to be in the vehicles, but there's no uh, obligation or, or legal requirement to use it. So uh, Attorney Mumpert, myself, uh, former Chairman Brunson met with our state delegation sometime at the end of 2018 and said, when you get up there in 19, please talk to the others about getting this obvious uh, problem that you've overlooked corrected. Well, it wasn't a problem that was overlooked. It was a problem that was meant to be like that because apparently up in Peachtree uh, City area, up in Atlanta, there's golf carts everywhere and they don't want to wear their seatbelts. So uh, our delegation was told, don't even touch that. It will go nowhere. You'll have no luck getting an obligation to wear seatbelts written into the law. So uh, don't blame us. Don't blame our attorney. Don't blame our police. You know, it's the way state law is, uh, is handled presently. Okay, here's another uh, non-controversial issue. It's the parks, uh, the two big trees at Neptune Park, these iconic oaks named after uh, uh, Isla and Neptune uh, Small. They're estimated to be 200 years old. Uh, if you really want the, the, the long story, uh, read today's uh, note in the Brunswick News written by Taylor Cooper. It was a, an excellent summary of a long debate we had in our uh, what's called work session yesterday. It's going to come again before uh, the full Board of Commissioners at Thursday night meeting, tomorrow night. Uh, there have been four different opinions. They range from cut them all down and plant new trees to put a big fence around it and, and do some, uh, some watering and fertilizing to uh, trim the higher lateral branches to take the weight off the lateral branches and crutch the lower branches that have not touched the ground uh, and then re start to reuse the uh, picnic area. I think that latter, uh, latter recommendation is, is in the lead right now with, with recognizing that there's many people in the community that disagree uh, vigorously with that. So what's a tree crutch? Um, so that's just a quick, uh, 
Here's what the tree crutches look like. So here's a, a, obviously a crutch. And here's something that uh, a man named uh, Roy Davis sent me when he was visiting uh, Rio de Janeiro in Argentina. That's a uh, uh, action figure holding up a branch. So these things come from just little tiny uh, uh, minimal crutches to something uh, more elaborate like a, an action figure. And I figured what we could do if we really wanted to invest the money is, is have Dave Austin as our model and get a, get a local sculptor to, to, to cast some iron you know, action figures of Dave Austin holding up our, our tree branches. And we only need about, uh, I think it's, it's four, yeah, there you go, four, four to six per tree. But uh, we'll see what we can do. We'll, we're going to have to find the money for that. So uh, next, uh, I think we're, do, we're doing OK on time. I apologize. Uh, this is going to be very important. Rewrite of the county ordinances. We've talked about this. It's a very important issue uh, moving forward. Uh, we need to uh, make changes in the way our local ordinances are written uh, in order to uh, try to get a, a handle. Oh, I'm sorry, on the uh, growth and development and uh, balance the development rights with so sound planning, uh, preserve our natural resources. Uh, I think I just saw Commissioner O'Quinn come in, and there's a seat for you up here, David. Okay, okay all, right, all right, all right. And then, um, when's it going to happen? There's going to be a kickoff meeting next, uh, I guess it's two or three Thursdays from now, down in the new uh, Glen County Library. Uh, I don't know if you all have heard, but there's a conference center downtown now, and it's in the library, the public library. It holds 400 people. And it's a beautiful facility, and that's where uh, we're going to hold the kickoff meeting. And it will uh, introduce uh, the zoning process, preliminary findings, and allow for initial input from the community. Pamela Thompson, our Director of Community Development, has left some flyers outside, so you can take them home to remind yourself of this meeting. It's going to be a very important meeting. I have no idea how it's going to work out. I'm hopeful. Uh, but I'm cautiously uh, hopeful. I, don't, I just don't know if we're going to be able to move, move that ball down the field and score any points because there is, as you know, uh, a great deal of resistance to any uh, restrictions placed on uh, unbridled growth and development. But I can tell you from our, our uh, survey done 2018, 80 plus percent of the people that live on St. Simons, that's their number one concern is the volume of growth and development and how it's impacting our in infrastructure. So what is this? Does anybody know? That's, uh, there you go. So for those of you that didn't recognize it, it's the black hole taken by NASA. And I don't mean any offense to anybody up there, Mr. Hours or anybody else, Chairman. But sometimes we discuss things, and, and I really feel like they fall into a black hole, and, and they just need to be pulled out again. So here are a couple of other things that are bubbling, and I have no idea where they're bubbling or whether they're ever going to come out. And I'm going to end with this. But they include, uh, I have no idea where we stand with the uh, embezzlement of a million dollars uh, from the clerk of court. I, I do believe we have some insurance. We have some bond money. And I believe a lot of that money will flow back to the county, but I don't know that for a fact. We're uh, right in the middle of figuring out how the Scarlett Williams uh, decision, the so-called Coleman case, where it was decided that a previous tax commissioner had set the uh, assessed valuation on many of the homes here. 17,000 homes are under the Scarlett Williams, and I believe 30% would have been impacted by this, something around that. Uh, but in any case, we need to reset the valuations and then figure out how that's going to impact our tax digest. Hopefully it will not have a big ta impact on our tax digest. But more importantly, there are many people who are owed back money because the valuation set on the home, there, therefore the taxes paid, uh, have been deemed to be too high. And, and we, have, we don't have a good mechanism uh, by which to, to, to uh, obtain that number as of yet. Uh, estimates have been as high as uh, 15, 20 million dollars were paid out uh, or, or, or uh, acquired that were collected over and above what they should have been done. But it's important to remember that many of that 15 to 20 million dollars, upwards of two thirds, uh, redounded to the benefit of the school system. So they may take as a bigger impact than us. 
but that, that's in the process. Uh, we discussed uh, impact fees at least a couple times uh, in our work sessions, and hopefully we're moving forward with that. I, I don't know where the possibility of the ferry service to Jekyll Island uh, stands. I always thought it was a great idea. It was going to be done by a private uh, group, the entrepreneurial uh, type approach. I have no idea where we stand. Uh, and then uh, I, I gotten a little bit of blistering heat about uh, mentioning a toll on the causeway, so I, I'm not going to mention it again, uh, of course, but forget it. I forget it, huh? Forget it. Well, we, as you all may or may not know, we need some money, okay? I've already said our property taxes don't meet those needs. You just saw Frederica, Demery, uh, repave. We're doing the village drainage project. That's just a fraction of what's being done in this county with SPLOS 2016. I think somebody said out of $72 million, uh, uh, Mr. Hours, correct me if I'm wrong, out of $72 million, I think $10 million are being spent in, 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 on St. Simons. So it's, we're, we're seeing a fraction. And my, but my point is, there's so much more that needs to be done. And without, for, the, for all those that oppose a toll, Think about what another revenue source might be. I don't know what it is, but uh, you know, as I've already mentioned the 250 to 500 million dollar uh, problem that our joint water and sewer system has. I don't know where that money is going to come from, uh, but we've got some issues. So, uh, with that being said, uh, we're ready for questions with a 7:10 end time. And uh, Matthew, are you all set up there? Yes, sir. Okay. So, uh, I, 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 I'm not sure I recognize the gentleman going up to the uh, to the microphone but if you'd be kind enough to give us your name uh and then I'll, I'll do that sure a minute and a half there my friend yeah okay uh got my timer here and i'll get it started i'm julian smith some people call me putty you're welcome to call me that uh my wife and i have enjoyed a home on saint simon's since 1993 20 what 26 years now um, we like it here very much. And uh, thank you, Commissioner uh, Murphy, for holding this. Uh, and thank you for holding down the opening to only 27 minutes. Uh, now, now that you've opened the floor to questions and comments from the public, um, I hope that when the public asks questions that the people with you at the podium, or rather at the table, will be brief um, and not ramble on as sometimes happened. Um, so, and you announce you'll be cutting public comments off uh, at about 7.10, so you have 20 minutes to prepare to show a 15 minute uh, video, which I, I've, I've only seen the, the trailer and it looks like it's going to be interesting. So there's not going to be much time for public uh, input, so I better speed it up. Um, in the trailer for that video, one islander says, my question is, who is planning for St. Simon's for the future? And another asks, so St. Simon, what is the plan? And the very last words in the trailer are spoken by a hired consultant from Savannah who claims what's essential is that we can be and open, have an open dialogue about the long-term planning that's meaningful and productive, and I hope you all agree. Last night, the Island Planning Commission met in this huge room. There were only 21 people in the room, seven members of the IPC, five members of the public, two newspaper reporters, two county videographers, one director of community development, one planning director, one official minute taker, one assistant county attorney, and one police officer to keep the five members of the public under control. And, and the IPC spent only 10 minutes and planned absolutely nothing and voted down a motion by George Ragsdale to discuss holding a workshop in another public meeting. Commissioners, please encourage your staff to stop keeping our best planning commissioners from doing the hard work of actually planning for the future on our island. Thank you. Thank you very much.
My name is Stan Kiker. Uh, I want to commend the commissioners for working towards regulations for short-term rentals. But I'm wondering if any of these regulations will deal with the problems that short-term rentals create. Just two weeks ago in King City, a residential R6 neighborhood, there were 22 to 25 people in a single family dwelling for one full week with 11 cars parked on the small streets there. Noise from the home and the pool area was continual. The impact that short-term rentals have on neighboring residential property is huge. For most residents, this is probably the largest financial commitment they've ever made. What and who they live next to is an important factor in deciding where to buy and to live. No one typically would choose to live next door to a short-term rental. So my question is, do you expect to limit the number of short-term rentals that can be situated in a residential neighborhood? And by the way, there are a lot of other questions, but in the interest of time, I'm going to end by asking, what can the county do to protect the residents who live here and are subjected to the situations like the one I just described? Or what recourse will a homeowner, a neighboring homeowner have when regulations are violated? And they will be. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I personally uh, seen the situation that, that Stan uh, uh, has uh, outlined here, and it really is uh, one of the great challenges. You know, it, it's starting to almost get to the level that Villa de Suenos, which is up by Gould's Inlet, that uh, created such a, a problem. But uh, my short answer would be yes, and, and that's really why we're trying to do this, is to create some body of regulations slash ordinances that limit the number of occupants in a home based upon uh, number of bedrooms, make sure that uh, sa the uh, smoke alarms are working, the ingress, egress is safe enough, and, and then the parking is another uh, offshoot of all that. But uh, I'd like to hear from uh, Aaron and, and Pamela wh what your thoughts are about that. His, his question was, do you think we're going to be able to deal with this, to handle it, to have an impact on this? What do you think? So there's some, there's some very good questions, and of course the goal of this would be to, to assist with these challenges that, that uh, these short-term uh, vacation rentals offer. Um, you know, we won't know what the, the ultimate uh, ordinance will look like. Ultimate, of course, that's up to the board. Uh, part of this process would include um, working with people who have seen this nationwide. And getting a set of best practices, uh, not only from, from the perspective of people here in Glen County, statewide, but just nationwide. And, and one of the components that host compliance, if the our board decides to go with them uh, first as a service, is to help us determine what the best practices are. So Commissioner Murphy mentioned some of the things that we could look at, but uh, you know, limiting the amount of people per bedroom, uh, addressing uh, challenges dealing with the parking, uh, having someone uh, local uh, is another option who can respond back to um, uh, challenges and issues and phone calls uh, that aren't out of town. Uh, those are things that we've seen and heard of uh, through the process. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of options we can look at, um, and I suspect there'll be a whole process. Uh, you know, once we start getting into the drafting process, uh, things we'll look at, present to the commissioners, and get their input on. Yeah, Pamela, do you have any thoughts, particularly regarding, uh, you know, as these people are get involved in doing this, I, I believe they're required to have a business license, uh, I, would, I would assume. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. I'm Pamela Thompson, the Director of Community Development. Um, we would look at not only mitigating the impacts being in a neighborhood, but making sure that people that come into a community and rent a home are renting a home that's safe and is not set up to be in a dangerous situation for them if something were to occur. I think my, there it goes. So we're going to look to make sure there are things such as checks on exits, um, number of exits, fire extinguishers, smoke detectors working, um, number of trash cans per unit so that there's not trash overflowing, which is a common complaint that we get. So we'll be working with the consultant, other communities that have done this in our attorney's office to make sure we try to mitigate um, as many of the negative impacts of short-term rentals as we can. Thank you. And, and so part of the... Uh Part of the uh, ask we would have of a, I, I keep saying host compliance. We have not signed a, 
uh, a contract with them. But let, there's, there's several firms like them out there. But let's just use their, their name for purposes of discussion. They offer four or five different uh, opportunities for us to utilize. One of them is monitoring, as I said, because the code enforcement people aren't here at night or weekends. There's a hotline you can call. And my, my hope would be if there was three legitimate uh, complaints of, of overcrowding, of, of, of noise and, and, and trash and, and uh, you know, behaving like reprobates, that at a certain point we cut them off and we pull their business license. There would be written in the ordinance, I would think, you know, and that would be the way you, you know. Look, the, the trains left the station. We've got 1,100 rental properties in, on, on St. Simons. We're not going to change that. But we can hold them to a standard of behavior such that those that have, you know, uh, valuable uh, homes and deserve the peace and quiet of a neighborhood get what they uh, deserve. Following up on that point, I would suggest the homeowners who are renting those properties then pass that uh, financial uh, detriment onto the folks that rented it, cause a problem in the first place, sue them out of existence would be my recommendation. As a, the homeowner really didn't do anything other than rent the house. It reprobates that are in there, the folks from Atlanta that are coming down here and partying, that those are the ones we need to find. Uh, but anyway, that's just second thought. I would agree with you, though. Could, paper, could, uh, paper. Could, you, could you tell us who you are, please, oh, sir? My name is Dob Waits. I've lived here on the island for eight years. Uh, paper clips and paper don't cost anything. Toner, at least in my home office, toner is where they get you. Just note to whomever, toner is a line item on the budget. Um, there was a sewer tie-in in my neighborhood, Wimberley, back on Wild Heron about two months ago. They just recently had repaved all of our neighborhood. Thank you very much. But when they ran across the street for the tie-in, there's now a big pothole and whatnot. I mean, it, it's sometimes it's that, it's that deep at some point. Whoever the contractor was who, tie, who cut across the pavement to tie-in for the sewer needs to be fined, needs to get out there and get that fixed pronto. I'm not sure what the re requirements are, but I'm, I'm here squawking about that. So that needs to be taken care of. Do you, can, can we answer that before you get to the... Uh, sure. David, are you aware of this? Is it a JWSC problem? Is that something that's uh, on us? What's, what's the address? It's probably about 300 wild heron, we might guess. Brand new construction um, as you're heading east. It's going to be the north side. On the north side of wild heron, <laughs> the only brand new construction. In so the we'll run it down. It's a JWSC issue. Typically, uh, uh, my counterpart here does the uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, right away. So it should have been something to do with the right away coordinator should have gotten on that. Fantastic. But we'll take care of that. No they, she may also be the one to recheck the, the paving. You mentioned how the Frederica Road and the Dimery look great. You didn't mention the Sea Island Road because out in front of, of, of Hamilton Landing, it's pathetic. Yeah, we did, we did that twice. We're not going to do it again. Okay, well, so the contractor... Was it bonded? Uh, I, yes, it was a performance bonded. Yeah. Well, I'd say we call it. That okay. it's it's if if that's acceptable paving, I'll pave the next one and let me go with it. I mean, it's it's bad. It, that was sad paving. Whoever it was, do we know who it was? Can we? Absolutely, we know who it was. Well, let's get their name out there. Who was it? Uh, it was never uh, use them again. W well, uh, yeah. That, they, they did a poor job. Okay, we the, got it. Keep the bond, moving. The bonding company. Keep moving. The bonding company should be called. I hear there's a speed limit discrepancy out in front of the fire station where it's marked 25 but it's supposed to be 30 or 35 or something? Is that is there any legitimacy to that? Uh, we, we are working on the various speed limits. Our great and good friend Matt Permar wrote an article about, what, three, four months ago now, Matt, about how the speed limits are not in alignment with ordinances. We are working about getting all the speed limits on the roads on the island in alignment with ordinances. And my last item, and I, I'm glad that we're looking at these uh, LSVs and whatever golf carts and not. Are there any age and licensing requirements that currently exist? In my understanding, you have to be a licensed driver to drive a motorized vehicle on our streets. Is that not correct? It's correct. Okay. So the county government has said that, the, or the police enforcement, we're going to be glad to enforce these future laws. <coughs> right now, we're letting this slide. Twelve-year-olds are driving up and down the road. I mean, if they don't look 16, pull them over. And if you're kids, shame on you. Got it. That uh, and um, I think that would be it. Thank you very All right, much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Who's next? Hello. Thank you for the opportunity. I am Diane Bowen Chilton. 
Um, I live over on the west side of the island. I live in Epworth Acres. I also work over in the medical complex over there. Um, and up to about four years ago, I was involved with a group of us that were meeting regarding safety and traffic area, um, issues that we anticipated might happen there. Um, and we are seriously in need of a safety crossing across Sea Island Road from the Hamilton area to the east side of the island. That is Hamilton Road is the logical place where all the Epworth Acres residents, everybody who visits Epworth, everybody who lives in all of the new building, you know, all the new development that's happened, that's where we cross across. And um, I regularly go across there with my sons who are 10 and six, and I am telling you, it is a point system meaning if you go across there, it is as if the drivers coming up to that intersection um, see you as um, bonus points um, for going across. We have a median going across our causeway protecting people both, both west and eastbound because there was a young man who lost his life and his father became very passionate about making the causeway safer and it has. What I do not want to have happen is us eventually get a pedestrian bike crossing at Hamilton Road or wherever we think that it needs to go, but it only gets there after we have a memorial event. So I would strongly urge, I know and I appreciate all the nice, lovely construction things that are happening to improve our roads, and I know it hasn't decided, been decided yet exactly what needs to happen or what is the best way to do it, but I don't think that we have the luxury to wait until the very best option has been decided. So I would just like to get your feedback on why can't we get a nice lighted crossing like they have in front of St. Williams, at least until we can figure out um, something better. Got it. Thank you, Dr. Bowen. So uh, this has been an item that we've discussed at many of the traffic meetings. and traffic engineers, and I think many of us who drive that road, would be concerned about either a traffic light or a flashing uh, crosswalk right there at Hamilton with, with all the volume of traffic that, that comes onto the island uh, through that roundabout. So, so presently, the solution uh, that we've uh, been working on, uh, Dr. Bowen, we got it. You're, you're done. I'm, I'm, I'm going to explain it as best I can. We need to get other people's questions in. And I understand your passion. We've met on this before. So presently, the solution that we have, and Dave, correct me if I'm wrong, is working with the traffic engineers, is run a uh, sidewalk from Hamilton and Sea Island Causeway up towards the Demery Road. Uh, put that, I guess that would be on the... Uh, the west side uh, of the road, uh, the side that you live on, run it up to Demery where there will be a traffic light there and people have an island and a crossing way to get over onto the east side of Sea Island Road and either head you know, uh, up Demery or, or down the other way on, on Frederica for that brief, brief period. That, David, tell us uh, where we stand with that. It's, uh, it's under design. We are waiting for the, uh, actually we're waiting for DNR to approve uh, the extension of the two culverts there so we can keep the sidewalk away from the road. I've had about five traffic engineers tell me that a mid-block crossing, that's what it's called right there at Hamilton Road, is not what you want to do. You want to take them down to the light, bring them across at the traffic signal. That's what we have planned. It's uh, probably 90% design. It's just ready, for, ready to get permitting. And then it'll get awarded and constructed. Okay, it, it just, it's been a discussion for, like I said, at least three or four years. And every time I go across with my boys, it's a concern and I'm not the only I, one. I so absolutely. I'll introduce you. This is Patty Sistrong. Yes, ma'am. We, we got it, Diane. Come on. Georgia Department of Transportation. Come on, don't take over the meeting. It, it's not, not, it's not the right thing to do. We've heard you. We're in the process. Can we move on, please? Yes, ma'am. Identify yourself. Hi, I, I think she was trying to. Um, I'm Patty Sistrunk. I'm a resident. I live in Epworth Acres as well. Um, 
I am also a contractor with the Georgia Department of Transportation. I work in bicycle and pedestrian advocacy and outreach throughout the state of Georgia. I don't live here on accident. I live here because it is a bicycle and pedestrian safe place. Um, except I'm trapped <laughs> on the east side of that causeway. Um, I know it's been a discussion for a while about bicycle and pedestrian access along um, Sea Island Road. It's, um, I've heard all kinds of stories about why it's been put, put aside, but I definitely suggest that it be um, a consideration for future SPLOS or other um, pursuits. I've been, you know, it's been suggested that it needs to be a nonprofit pursuit, but um, I think that when you all discuss traffic, you need to remember that there are two modes of transportation on this island that are really important to not only tourism, but um, helping to eliminate the vehicular traffic is encouraging and enabling bicycle and pedestrian traffic. And folks like Dr. Diane bike to work. They bike places on this island. And so you've got to keep that in mind. And um, waiting until design and asking traffic engineers, about, you engineer for people, not for cars. And so it'd be really awesome to engineer an intersection to be safer for people to cross, whether you lower the speed limit, you light an intersection, you do whatever it takes. But I just, I don't know if I feel safe crossing that intersection at Demery and Sea Island when there is a slip lane that literally had a sign that said, no stopping or slowing, keep moving. So that's, that's where our concern is. We both have small children. We would both love to be able to bike up with our kids to St. Simons Elementary or to other places on this island, but currently I don't feel safe doing it, and I am a bike advocate, so. Well, thank you. You, you, you made many excellent points, and even though it may not seem, it, seem like it, I totally agree with you. I've been, been trying to uh, work with others that want to put a, a, a bike lane all along Sea Island Causeway, and that's been discussed many times in the past. Guess where the biggest problem is? M-O-N-E-Y. You got it. Uh, so. You may not uh, agree with the plan, but the plan is out, as outlined. And we will change the signalization in some fashion at that intersection. Right, David? Help me. Uh, and we're talking about as you take that, that sidewalk up towards Demery, uh, there is that uh, right-hand through lane. There's going to be something there to alert those drivers that bikers or pedestrians are crossing, correct? There will be a button for pedestrians to mash. There you go. I mean, it's not great. Just, like, just like any other intersection yeah. where pedestrians uh, match a button guess and what? they get a walk or don't walk sign. There's a lot of traffic on this island. We're trying to deal with it. I agree with you totally. More bike paths, more sidewalks, more money. You know, jo join, me, join me in the quest for more revenue. Yes, sir. Oh, my gosh. Go ahead. Good evening. My name is Ed Meadows. I'm a resident of Glenn County. And I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, these sessions are extremely valuable to the community. And even though it's not always completely satisfying to everyone here, I think that the opportunity to have a community forum is excellent. There are a lot of citizens who wish that you would have an opportunity for a substantive dialogue about land use planning because there's a lot of concern about that. But I'm not going to talk about that right now. I want to simply mention that St. Simons Island is a barrier island in the ocean. You would not know that by listening to the community dialogue or reading the local paper because it's very rarely mentioned. I'm mentioning it now because of the discussion about Splost. Being a barrier island means that we don't have a lot of downhill to go for drainage and we have a drainage problem here. So my question is, what is Glenn County doing to use pervious pavement materials with the SPLOS projects? Because the technology is well established, pervious pavement, pavement works. They're using it at Fletsy now. What can we do in Glenn County to increase the use of pervious materials in our paving and parking areas? Thank you. Dave, is that uh, in your ballpark? Well, I know, I know at Flexi they have the uh, the village out there, and it's all per, uh, pervious pavement. Uh, I know uh, on the island there's a couple of areas that have pervious pavement. It's not the end all. Uh, they've talked about that uh, out at the new master planning for the beach. 
Uh, it requires maintenance. It's got to be swept or vacuumed. Uh, it does, uh, doesn't hold up. If you go to the monkey wrench uh, bicycles, you'll see the pervious pavement in there that the trucks have beaten up over time. So uh, it's, 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 it's not necessarily the end all. We're not designing any of, any of our roads that receive a lot of traffic and pervious pavement. Uh, I, I don't think I have any parking lot uh, projects in the Splost. I do have some sidewalks and uh, we're, we are not looking at pervious pavement on those sidewalks, mainly because uh, we get a lot of uh, traffic on the sidewalks, not only bicycles, but utility vehicles that often break parts of the sidewalks and we have to end up replacing them. So uh, from a structure point of view, uh, we prefer, uh, we don't, we don't uh, prefer the pervious pavement. Great, thank you. Uh, anybody, uh, we, uh, while you're walking up, sir, let me just, uh, while you get loaded, I want to ask uh, Catherine Downs, our assistant county manager, to help me about uh, the, the questions I was raising on the uh, revetment, <laughs> the rock and rock uh, revetment. I'll give you mine. Uh, how are we going to distinguish private property from public property and get, get the whole wall built? Thank you. Um, well, as you mentioned, yes, we do have some areas of the revetment that are in private property, um, and, and a large uh, portion of it is public property. So you correctly identified that we can't do um, any type of improvement on private property, but what we will... You know, in talking with uh, the consultants from ATM, uh, what we will be able to do is provide some level of, you know, um, a, not, uh, some sort of program for private uh, home, homeowners who own those pieces of land uh, where the revetment is, uh, some sort of program where they can opt in to purchase the rocks. Uh, right now, the project has been submitted to uh, DNR and the Corps of Engineers to um, permit the entire structure. Um, so if you, as a private landowner, have a portion of those rocks, um, you can, that portion will already be permitted for improvement. So that hurdle has been uh, negotiated. So. So that will help you as a private homeowner, and then we'll just have to figure out the best way to kind of loop private homeowners into um, the program to, if they're interested in purchasing rocks and piggybacking on our project, we'll, we'll work out some way to do that. Great. Question from the audience. See, that's very, uh, very uh, unusual and inappropriate, but go ahead. And I think that's, I don't, he asked why the owner couldn't just grant an easement to the county. I know in discussions with our county engineer, uh, Paul Andrews, um, in discussions that I have had with him, that might potentially be a possibility, but that might be more of a, a question for our county attorney. I don't know if he has any input on that. We don't need to answer that tonight. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to make sure everybody gets a chance to answer the question. Re remember, the movie is going to be a... 15-minute uh, documentary at, uh, starting about 7.15-ish. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I think we're going to start this project somewhere around November, so we've got some time. But we need to keep the ball rolling in terms of the discussion because, as I said earlier, it would be, be really tragic to have a 9-foot wall and then 6 feet and have those people, when the storm comes, get battered because they just haven't built up a s sufficient wall. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Ron Grubb. I live in Sea Palms West. I just wanted to make a comment about the repairs that were done on Frederica next to Brogan's North that you talked about in your presentation. I, I don't think the repair work was done very well. And the previous speaker talked about other repair work that he didn't feel had been done very well, but I don't know who did the repair, whether it was joint water and sewer or an outside contractor or public works. But somebody needs to monitor these repairs to make sure that they're done properly because I've, there's actually two that are right there pretty close together. I don't know if they were related to the same project or not. But 
the road was beautiful when it was repaved. These things are going to happen in the future where we're going to have to dig into the new pavement. But we can make good repairs so that these roads don't end, end up being potholed again very quickly. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. There's, there's absolutely uh, no excuse, and, and I'm hoping that that was not the final product. Dave, you're getting a lot of air time. Help me out. What's, what, what's the... We, uh, Mr. Deloach and I have already talked about that, and having a current contractor that's doing Federica come back and repair that area that was done by Joint Water and Sewer. We also have a small pothole in front of uh, Fire Station 4 that's somehow developed. I don't, know where, no, I don't know where that thing came from. I don't know what's under there, but it got filled today. But uh, we're keeping an eye on that. Those are the two areas that we're concerned about. Uh, you're right about the uh, repair. Uh, we were concerned about, uh, I mean, it, I, I, I monitored the repair because I drove by it a couple of times, but uh, I don't think they filled under the road, which needed to be filled under the road. really needs to be peeled back and done correctly, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll probably be, end up doing that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think, I think this, uh, one thing we have to remember is a lot of the work that's being done here is being done by J uh, when when the when the water, water pipes break and the sewer lines break, they're doing the work, and and I I don't know that they've got somebody like Dave Austin that's that's monitoring this carefully, and so as you drive into where we are tonight, see palms, and you come up Palm or Colonial, and, and and you see the potholes and this and that. We've talked about this before, but JWSC needs to replace what is it, Dave, the water or the sewer pipe there? I, I believe they have a little bit of both. There, but so uh, so, yeah. so we want to we want to get these roads repaved that lead into sea palms, but we don't want to repave them and then have them come in and rip it all up to have to do the work that's just in the queue, and you know with the backlog of work they have, who knows how long their queue is? So those are some of the challenges we're facing. Yes, sir. Peter, my name is Bob Franklin. I'm a member of the uh, Citizens Oversight Committee for the SPLOS 216. Um, a couple of comments uh, from our perspective. Uh, one is that, uh, as you know, there's a $100 million eSPLOS underway in the county. Uh, and that group has an oversight committee, and they hired a very expensive consulting firm to help them manage the process. At Alan Hour's request, we agreed to use the county staff, and the county staff has done a hell of a job. Uh, there's a lot of projects underway, and I think you folks on the commission should be very proud of what they're doing and how well they're accomplishing those many projects. You had the uh, opportunity to comment earlier that uh, the island's going to need uh, a very large amount of money spent on its water and sewer uh, in the near future or in the long future. I think you used big numbers like 250 and 500 and so forth. Those are big numbers. Uh, but everything starts with a first step, and I would like to point out in SPLOS 2016, uh, the water and sewer has no money for St. Simon's Island projects. There's nothing in there at all, and that ball is in your court. Thank you, Bob. I, I agree that we've had uh, some great, great people in the county staff monitoring these projects, and they're, the only certainty of these projects is the uncertainty that you're going to find when you dig up some of the roads around here. But in terms of uh, SPLOS 2016 and, and the number I threw out there about JWIC, that's a countywide uh, number. And that's a 20-year projection number that I've, I've gotten from direct conversations with the, with the uh, administrative staff down at JWSC. We don't hear about those numbers very much anymore because they've kind of changed their approach. But that being said, I agree with you. Uh, we, we're still in the formative phase of what we're going to do with uh, JWSC and, and how long the SPLOST is going to be and what the anticipated revenues. But but I know that Chairman Browning is here listening intently to your comment, and uh, myself and Commissioner O'Quinn share y y your views. We, we need JWSC over here to take care of our problems. To me, to say that we've got water quality that's graded D, as in dog, 
and our wastewater treatment plant is D plus does not make me feel really good. Yes, sir. Nice to see you again. Hey, good to see you again, yeah. Peter. My name is David Lewis, and I think we can all agree that joint water and sewer stinks, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So the only reason I'm here, and you're, this is going to sound similar, familiar to you, is because I read that there are experts here that might have some information. So uh, here we go. We got Peter Murphy. You've made your life that you have now from being a great surgeon. I imagine that on a regular basis in your career, you would not perform unnecessary surgeries. I'm certain you never went into a surgery blind. You knew the tests that were done previous to the patient. You knew the data on the circumstance at hand, correct? So I'm just wanting to make sure that the same level of understanding of a problem has taken place before you venture out to quote, fix a problem such as a surgery. We wouldn't try to just go in automatically to try to fix a problem. We don't even know if there is a problem. So Glen County has about 1,200 short-term rentals at 80% booking rate. That puts us at about 1,000 booked nights, okay? For every single night, there's 1,000 bookings. For the entire year, that's 365,000 booked nights. Out of all of those, how many compliance issues were documented in 2018? This may show up in the form of noise complaints or um, uh, fire code violations because we've got too many people staying in a, a rental and I don't know who's who, so uh, I was asking the experts. Okay, D Dave, finish up your question and then uh, I'll ask the experts. Well, well that is okay. that's my question. All right, good. All right. We'll get to it, thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh, so there's no you, response. Well, there's going to be a response right now. I just oh, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, hey, he and I had lunch the other day. We do not agree at all on this process, but he is incredibly smart. And uh, tell everybody what you do with the school system. Well, uh, one, one of the things I do is I teach computer science to uh, Glen Academy. Yeah. Our so AP he's, guys. he's a great, great Glen County citizen. We just happen to be on the opposite side of this. So I'll, I'll ask the experts. Pamela? Do we have any idea through code enforcement uh, in, uh, recognizing that they are not on duty nights and weekends? Any idea of, of, of how big a problem they perceive or, or actual data they might have on short-term rentals? So we do have a software system where we log every single one of our customer complaints no matter what it is regarding. Um, I did not come prepared to tell you tonight out of 365,000 bed nights how many complaints we receive. We receive a lot after the fact and unfortunately our police department receives a lot of complaints that should come to us after hours. But I do think that that is something that I could work with our other enforcement agencies and we could come up with um, a ballpark or some sort of data to um, analyze the amount of complaints that we're given. We're also uh, fortunate to have Chief Powell here. Any, any insight at all? I know you've been uh, Chief now for, what, a little over a year? Um, and, and my understanding is uh, in, in past, so, some, some of the uh, urban myths or the police don't believe they have the o ordinance support to go in and, and, and take any significant actions, but just in your period of time talking to the officers, do you have any insight about how big a problem short-term rentals are or, or whether your officers feel like they've got the, the tools necessary to, uh, to intervene when intervention is, is required? Well, uh, once again, uh, I am the, the chief of the Glen County Police Department, and uh, I didn't come prepared to answer your question about the number of calls that we come in, but every call that comes in is tracked through 911. We can go back and check on the number of noise complaints for a certain geographical area. Uh, as far as the tools that we have to get the job done, it's kind of a moving target. Things evolve and they change. And when I say that, it's through case law, uh, through changes in state law, and also through lo uh, local ordinances. Um, I, I do think that we have a problem. It goes seasonal, uh, depending on, you know, like we just went through spring break when we had a, a big rush of, of uh, students that came out. Uh, and also, uh, during the summertime, you know, we have problems that we, that we deal with. I will uh, point to the fact that we opened up a substation full-time here on the island, or started staffing that substation, should I say. Uh, we do have a, a permanent presence out here now with a good, a good number of personnel who try to respond to the calls as they come in, and they try to be just as proactive as they can uh, to address the call before it even happens. 
Uh, do we fall short sometimes? Absolutely. Uh, because sometimes we do get overwhelmed because of the number of people that come to the island. Uh, but the, the officers are working very diligently to try to address all the problems that come up. And, uh, and if we come up with a solution that may address an issue, we try to work hand in hand with the county attorney who is very active with the police department and we try to draft recommendations to present to the board of commissioners. So I know that's not very satisfactory, David. I know you and I are going to have to agree to disagree, but I don't know if you're here earlier when Mr. Kiker got up and talked about 22 people in the home next to him. And I can guarantee you that's not an 11-bedroom house and there are 11 cars outside. So but there are problems. But fire code violation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I got it. So, I got it. All right. Hey, thanks a lot, Mark. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, okay, this is going to be the last question, Bill. Make it quick here. we got a movie to watch. I don't want to take up too much of your time, Peter. I'm Bill Gusman. And I live on the island and I run a small hotel, uh, Gray Owl Inn. And uh, just to alert the commissioners, in case you don't realize this, there are three separate taxes that any hotel has to pay. There's a accommodations tax, and I just wrote a check to you guys for over $1,000. And that's accommodation tax is 5% of the monthly rental. There's also a bed tax, $5 per room per night that has to be paid. And then there's a 15% there's a state sales tax of which a portion of that comes back to the county in terms of the lost and the two spots taxes. So there's at least $8 out of every 100 that comes back to this county. This is money that you need to develop, and it's, you're not getting it, not from the 1,100 short-term rentals that you've got. So I urge you to get on with it and get this program going, because there's a lot of money that's just falling down, and you're not collecting it. Just thought you might want to know. Well, thank you. Thank you for your comments, Bill. Okay, as we said, we're going to shut the questions uh, off at 710. Um, I wonder uh, if we could have uh, you all set to put it up. Uh, Lan Lance Lipman and George Crane. Lance is back in the far corner back there, and uh, George is uh, r over here. And uh, be a 15-minute film that's uh, worth staying. Uh, no popcorn or soda, but it's uh, it's worth seeing. So uh, let's get it going. And and you all uh, may want to get uh, front row seats or seats in the back, let's say. It can seem like time stands still on St. Simons, but just like people, communities are constantly changing. Long life, long resident on St. Simons. My family's been here since the mid 1800s. To live in St. Simons and not see it from the water or be out of the ecosystem that surrounds it is missing half of the quality of the lifestyle. The island was still pretty small then. You knew everybody. You know, if you lived on St. Simons and you were a kid, I knew you. When I first moved here, there were three traffic lights on St. Simons. After dark, two of them blinked. We had to climb up a big sand dune behind my house, where the fourth house from the end of these trees. Climb up the oak trees on the top of the oak trees, thick with vines, and could climb all the way to the Coast Guard Station, one mile away, and never touch the ground. Can you imagine that? The building is still 1950. And the shops, I hope they never change. They're all small and intimate and usually run by second and third generation families. The pier is to me is a magical place and I do love going to the pier, talking with the fishermen that are out there very interested in what they're catching. People here routinely check with nature first before they make their plans. It's what it all 
tails. It's how small it is. It's how sweet it is. It's how, you know, the waitress is going to call me sweetie and the random guys on the beach are going to know my grandfather, you know? When we visited different places, we chose St. Simon's Island because it seemed like the best place to raise our girls. This is my Disney World. This is not contrived keepers. There is a lot of keepers here, but it's, it's authentic. It's still a small city. I call it Mayberry with the Beach. It's easy to fall into living here where you can get lost in a day and not be bothered. It's the whole thing. I mean, this is a real place where real people live. It's not a manufactured community. For me, the history that African American people who, you know, were brought to this country brought a whole culture, a whole culture here, and it was still alive. When you're coming to St. Simon's, the first unusual experience you have is crossing five miles of gold, beautiful marshlands. It's important to talk about character in St. Simon's because the character is defined through the balance of the natural environment as well as the built environment. The main question people want to know is how do you preserve this way of life that exists here on St. Simon's and how do you preserve it for future generations? My question is who is planning for St. Simon's for the future for seaward growth? Infrastructure is strained to the breaking point. Better manage our school water runoff. They'll set back to set back. Flooding, but, but there wasn't flooding anymore. As much as we love the place, everybody else loves it too. Better protect our habitat. It's changed a whole lot the way it used to be. People are blowing their horns now. I think it's just going a little too fast. a lot bigger, a lot more touristy, a lot more crowded, it loses some of its appeal. I mean, it used to be a time we had a ghost town, and that's where you really got to know everybody locally. St. Simon's is not a person. St. Simon's is a community. But I think there's a continuity of everyone who lives on St. Simon's, and I think defining those common values is what really is going to help St. Simon's in controlling its own future. How much does it cost? 
So what we're doing is both preserving the ecological character of the island as well as improving the quality of life by keeping additional rooftops and cars off the island and putting less stress on our water and sewer infrastructure.
People should recognize that the time is now. The game is on. When these undeveloped properties are bought for development, they're gone forever. There is no other place in this country, in this world, the coastal Georgia. And St. Simons is a huge part of that. One of the things I love about St. Simons is that it's not noisy. You can think, you can meditate, you can appreciate the ocean. It is important that each of us develop our own sense of ownership for this beautiful home. I think it's the greatest place on earth. And I can't imagine living anywhere else. And where are we going to leave for our children and our grandchildren and our great grandchildren and the people who come 5,000 years after we're here? We're a real spoiled in a good way. I'm grateful I live here. Living here builds me up. Every day I appreciate being here. I actually love where I live. This is where I want to be. It's important that we not let success destroy what makes this island so special. There's no one person or no one entity that is singularly responsible. It's everyone's responsibility. I want us to develop in a quality and peaceful manner. I want this to be a place of refuge. The ones that find St. Simons are looking for a treasure place. And when they move here, they have found their treasure. that that's an incredibly powerful uh, movie and is very, very professionally done. And we're fortunate to have George Crane straight back in the back. And Lance Lipman is over here. And so that concludes tonight's program. But uh, they both are going to stay and answer your questions uh, straight up face to face. And if, if you're, you're with a group or you're with an organization that you think might be in uh, want to see this uh, production? Talk to them about it. Be happy to put it up at your uh, at your next meeting. Thank you for coming, everybody. Thank you so much. Great. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Nothing.